Hello, thank you for logging on to this Bible teaching session as we continue a series arranged by the Christians meeting at Ammonville Gospel Hall, and the subject is Paul's letter to the Colossians. The passage I'm going to look at uh, today is in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 25. Paul has been telling the Christians at Colossae about their position in Christ. He says that they have put off the old man, that is, uh, their position before God has changed once they were in Adam, the old man, and now they are in Christ. And he says, you've put off the old man and you have put on the new man. And this is to do with the Christian's position before God. It's a wonderful thing if we're saved by the grace of God. If we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, then as far as God is concerned, we have stripped off, as it were, everything that belongs to the old man, and we have put on a new standing before God, and we stand before God accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul is now showing in this passage and in this chapter that our position has a practical outworking. It has a practical demand. And so he says, you have put off the old man, so put away all the things that belong to the old man. And then in our section, it's a more positive. He says, you have put on the new man, so put on practically all that belongs to this new kind of living, this new position that we have before God. This is an interesting passage, a very challenging passage, and we're going to read it in a moment, but let me just point out before we do so, there are three distinct sections. First of all, from verse 12 down to verse 14, Paul is telling them to put on. He uses the picture really of somebody putting on clothing. Now, really, it's not about the actual clothing that a Christian wears. Clothing in the Bible, garments in the Bible are used uh, as symbolical of character. And so Paul is talking about, he's got seven great virtues that should clothe the Christian. So we're going to look at that. The clothing of the new man is the first section. And then he talks about three controlling principles of the life of the new man. And so from verse 15 down to verse 17, he talks about three great principles that control the life of the new man. And then finally, from verse 18, right down to the end of the chapter, and actually into verse 1 of chapter 4, he talks about the conduct of the new man in earthly relationships. He looks at different relationships. We have earthly ties, earthly responsibilities, and he shows that our standing in Christ as having put on the new man, it has a direct bearing on our everyday lives. So this is a very practical passage. I'm sure we're going to discover that as we read it together. Let's read the passage then. Colossians chapter 3 and reading from verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So Paul has been talking about the clothing of the new man. Verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. In this passage, Paul is now talking about the control, the controlling principles of the new man. And verse 18, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. 
but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong that he has done, and there is no respect of persons. Masters, give to your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Amen. This final section has to do then with the conduct of the new man in the various earthly relationships and responsibilities. And so we're going to look just briefly at the clothing of the new man, the control of the new man, and the conduct of the new man. First of all, Paul addresses them, you'll notice in verse 12, in three ways. He calls them the elect of God, chosen of God, and then he calls them holy, and he calls them beloved. And he's really saying that because God in his great purpose and grace has chosen us, and because he has made us holy in his sight and set us apart for himself, that's the meaning of the word holiness, and because we are beloved, we have been brought into the circle of God's love, then because we have experienced all these abundant blessings, then we are obligated to put on to adopt, to very definitely and distinctly adorn ourselves and clothe ourselves with these wonderful virtues and graces. And he mentions seven of them. And then in the last verse, verse 14, he says, now, above all, it's as though this is the final sort of belt or sash that, that goes around all the clothing and keeps them all together. He says, above all, and he talks about love which is the great uniting bond that keeps everything together and that uh, controls and guides and keeps together all the different virtues of the Christian life. Let's just think of these seven virtues that we must put on, seven, if you will, items of clothing. We read of them, first of all, in verse 12. He says, bowels of mercies, that's number one, which is compassion, kindness, number two, number three, humbleness of mind, number four, meekness, number five, long-suffering, number six, forbearing one another, and number seven, forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I always find it helpful when we come across and we do come across in the Bible very often lists of virtues that are to be seen in the life of the Christian, I always find it helpful to think of what the opposite is, to contrast it with the opposite thing. And so that could be helpful in this list. Let's have a look at it again. Let's look at the seven virtues. Well, first of all, we have compassion. And the opposite of this compassionate interest and care for people is a callousness and an indifference that can mark us at times. Secondly, kindness. The Christian is expected to exhibit this kindliness, and the opposite of kindness is cruelty. Thirdly, humility. Well, we understand that the opposite of humility, of course, is pride. In fact, when we read in Proverbs chapter 6, about six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him. The first thing he hates is what the Bible calls a proud look. Number four, meekness. This lovely, lowly, gentle uh, attitude and frame of mind that should be seen in the Christian world, the opposite of that is arrogance and self-assertion. These things ought never to be seen in the Christian. Then number five, long-suffering. Well, if we think of long-suffering, the opposite is short-tempered, and we can be short-tempered with each other at times when we ought to be long-suffering and be willing to give people the benefit of the doubt and to bear with them. And that leads on to the sixth one, which is forbearing. Forbearing means that we are tolerant of each other and our different personalities. Sometimes we can be very critical and judgmental when we ought to cut each other some slack to use a modern expression, and we need to be forbearing. And finally, number seven is forgiving. And this is a lovely grace. And Paul says, even as Christ forgave you. And so if you've got a grudge against somebody, don't harbor that grudge. Paul is saying that's the opposite of forgiving. We'll never forget something. We'll always hold on to it. We'll bring it up. No, no, Paul says, do the opposite of that. Forgive just as Christ has forgiven you. So it can be quite helpful to see this uh, as uh, standing in contrast to the opposite of these virtues. 
But I think possibly a more helpful way of looking at the list, and we're not going to look at each one in detail, but it's wonderful to see that these virtues are all seen perfectly in the new man himself, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we think of him as he was here on earth, what a wonderful example he is, a demonstration of the characteristics and the virtues of the new man. There was never anyone that showed compassion like Christ or kindness or humility. He was the one who could say, I am meek and lowly in heart. He exercised long suffering and forbearance with those who did not understand and were so slow to learn. And the Lord Jesus, of course, is the great exemplar of forgiveness, as Paul mentions in this very passage. And so these are wonderful virtues. And as we meditate on them, as we think about them, we're challenged to think that often we display the opposite of these things in our lives. And we need, by the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, to put on these wonderful characteristics, these items of clothing that belong to the new man. And then Paul says in verse 14, and above all, he said, put on a charity or love. It's the agape love, which is the uniting bond of perfectness. In other words, Paul is saying, if somebody is really controlled and over all their life, there is this enveloping uh, sash uh, or belt of love, then everything that they do will be flowing from that. And so someone who's, who's controlled by love will be a meek person, a kind person, and so on, displaying the virtues that we have seen. And this love unites. And the interesting thing is, it not only unites the graces, it unites the graces in the individual believer, but it is a very uniting factor in the companies of the Lord's people. And that's what Paul is really talking about here, because all these characteristics he's mentioned, they have to do with our relationships with other Christians. And so Paul is saying, if you are marked by love overall, supremely, then this is a very uniting, it's not divisive, it's a very uniting thing. And so this is the, the clothing, not the literal clothing, of course, but symbolically the characteristic, the virtues of the new man. Then he goes on in verse 15 to talk about the controlling principles of the life of the new man. What really motivates the Christian? What controls the Christian's life? What really makes the Christian tick? That's what Paul is talking about. And he talks about three things here. First of all, he talks about the peace of Christ. Our authorized version says the peace of God, but I think probably more accurately, it should be the peace of Christ. And then he talks about the word of Christ. And then he talks about the name of Christ. And so these are three great principles Let's look at them very briefly. Three great principles, governing, guiding, controlling principles that mold and shape the life of the Christian. Paul says in verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you're called in one body and be ye thankful. The peace of Christ. How wonderful. We could think of it in at least two ways. We could think of the peace of the Lord Jesus exhibited, the calmness, that uh, lovely quality that he exhibited while he was here. He was the one who was the Prince of Peace, of course, but as we see him in his life, whatever circumstance and situation we find him in, we discover that there is that unflappable, unruffled calm of the Lord Jesus. And we would love to just have that kind of peace and calm in our lives. Or perhaps Paul is talking about the peace that we have through Christ, the peace that he gives to us. And either way, Paul is saying, let that peace, and I think it's the enjoyment of the peace, the enjoyment of the peace of Christ, let the peace of Christ arbitrate. That's the word. Let it rule. Let it rule in your hearts. In other words, as I live my life, this is a guiding principle, a controlling principle, and that is, is what I'm doing is the things I'm engaged in. Are, are these things conducive to the peace of Christ? Are they helping me to enjoy the peace of Christ in my heart? Or are they disturbing that peace in some way? And so the arbiter is the idea of the judge as somebody who decides this way or that way. And it's a very good principle, isn't it, in our Christian lives to judge everything 
by the peace of Christ? Can I adopt this lifestyle? Can I go along with this course of action? Or will it disturb the peace that I enjoy in my Savior, the peace of Christ himself? A wonderful principle. And there are times in our lives that we are not sure which way to turn. We look to God for guidance, and sometimes it's difficult to know the way ahead. And this is a great guiding principle, a controlling principle, the peace of Christ arbitrating, ruling in our hearts. And he talks about the word of Christ. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I think here we have these scriptures. And what Paul is saying is that a great controlling and guiding principle in the life of a Christian, in the life of the new man, is the word of God. And it's not simply memorizing the scriptures or even obeying the scriptures, although that's all involved. It's not simply knowing the word of God. It's allowing the word of Christ to dwell in us, to be at home in our hearts and in our lives, to, to be part of our being and to dwell in us richly. The idea is allow it to enrich us. That's the idea. Allow it to dwell in our hearts in all its fullness. So obviously I must read the Word of God. I must get to know the Word of God. And I must meditate on the Word of God. I must enjoy the Word of God. I must allow it to have its transforming power in my life and to be enjoying day by day the Scriptures, the Word of Christ. And Paul says, if you do that, there will be at least two outcomes he describes here. First of all, we could say there will be a sermon on your lips and then there will be a song in your heart. Because he says, if you are allowing the word of Christ to dwell in you, you will be able to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And so if I am allowing the scriptures to fill me, to thrill me, to direct me, to guide me, if I'm enjoying the Word of God, then I will find that I have something to give to others. I have something to share with other people. I have something to help others, to encourage them, to guide them perhaps, and I'll be able to bring out from this great store of the Word of Christ with all wisdom. That's a wonderful thing, to bring out with all wisdom the Word that is just necessary for the occasion. And it may not be that I know the exact scripture to turn to, but it's, the idea is that the scriptures are so molding my thinking and my attitude that I am able out of that to act wisely towards others and to help other people. There's a sermon, you might say, on my lips because the word of God is, the word of Christ is dwelling richly within. But then secondly, there's a song in my heart because he says, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So someone who's enjoying the word of God, there is a joy, there is a deep inner praise and singing in their heart. This is a wonderful expression. And he talks about three things, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, there's a great variety of how we can express our praise and thanksgiving and our joy in the Lord. The psalms, as has often been said, possibly looking right back to the psalms of David, the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament psalms, hymns, it has been suggested that hymns are those expressions of praise and worship that are directly addressed to God. And perhaps spiritual songs. Well, songs are odes. They could be in, in classical, uh, the classical world. They could be the great odes, uh, the classical odes, the tales, the dramas. But it's qualified here, spiritual songs. And so perhaps these are songs of our spiritual experience, songs of our pilgrimage, songs of our, our blessings in Christ, songs of what we enjoy as we encourage each other by singing. And so here is a wonderful treasury that we have. We have the Psalms of David, the inspired songs of the Old Testament. We have hymns, uh, uh, scriptures of praise and worship addressed to God. And then we have, and we're so grateful for the heritage that we have, spiritual songs written by those who've experienced the Christian pathway, and they help us on our way. And so here is somebody really in allowing the word of Christ to dwell in them richly, and it overflows in songs of praise, singing with grace in their hearts to the Lord. So that's the second great principle. The first principle is the peace of Christ. The second principle 
the word of Christ. Now, the third is the name of Christ. And so Paul says in verse 17, whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. What does this mean? I think what it means when we read of the name of the Lord Jesus, we do something in somebody's name when they are absent, and we do it with their authority. We're acting on their behalf. And so if you do something in my name, I've given you permission to act for me because I'm not present. I can't do it myself. And so I ask you to do it in my name, and you do it in a sort of proxy way. You act on my behalf. And this is a wonderful thing, that when we read in the New Testament of doing things in the name of the Lord Jesus, it's the idea of acting as if he were acting himself. And so Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, let this be the guiding principle that you're doing it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Somebody has said, it's a principle of my life that I must examine everything I do and say, could the Lord sign his name to this? Because I'm doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm doing it uh, on, you might say, his behalf. And so this gives, this raises the standard of Christian living. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it worthily, do it for the Lord, do it in his name. That's the idea. And with a thankful spirit. And so these are the great principles, the three great uh, guiding, controlling principles of the new man, the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and the name of Christ. Now Paul turns in the final section to the conduct of the new man in earthly relationships. The letter to the Colossians has some very lofty teaching, some very, we might term, abstract ideas of our position in Christ. In fact, in chapter 3, earlier on, Paul says, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. It seems almost so mystical and, and uh, quite abstract. And yet, we discover that these wonderful truths have a very down-to-earth outworking and implication. And so we discover here that Paul is examining the earthly relationships we find ourselves in, and he's e explaining and exhorting the Christians to conduct themselves in a way that is fitting for the new man. And so he has three pairs here. He talks about wives, he talks about husbands, he talks about children, talks about fathers, he talks about servants and masters. And so there are the three couplets, the three pairs, wives, husbands, children, fathers, servants, and masters. And he has a word for each group. He is going to say how we should act in all these different relationships on earth. Let's look at these very briefly. Verse 18 says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Here is the first direction that wives, those who are married, uh, should submit themselves to their own husbands. This is something that is very opposed in the society in which we live today. And yet this is the secret of a very happy marriage and a God-honoring marriage where the husband takes the lead and the wife is happy to submit to her husband's lead and direction in the marriage. And then secondly, to balance that, he addresses the husbands and he says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. In other words, he's saying, if you have this situation where a husband truly loves his wife, now if you're going to love your wife to that extent, you'll find that your wife has no problem with submission to your lead and your direction in the marriage. And so we have this wonderful picture of the Christian marriage. The wife is submissive to the husband, the husband is lavishing his love, a sacrificial love on the wife. And Paul says, don't be bitter. In other words, this is the sweetness of Christian marriage. There's something very sweet and precious about a couple who are acting like this. It's the conduct that is befitting the new man, our new position in Christ. And then he turns to children, and he says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Now, this is lovely, because Paul doesn't say this about the wife's submission, or the husband's love, or even the servant's service, and the master and his fairness. He doesn't say it's well-pleasing to the Lord, but he says for the children, 
It's a word for the children. I can imagine the letter being read out publicly in the church. And the children, perhaps it's all going over their heads. Uh, the believing children, they can't really understand much about our life being hid with Christ and God and the fact that we've been, that the old man has been stripped off and we've put on the new man. But then the word turns to them, children, here is a message for you, that you can be well-pleasing to the Lord. Here is a child who wants to please the Lord. And here is the way to do it, by submitting to your parents and obedience. And so we have the submission of the wife, we have the love of the husband. That's a balance. But then we have a balance now in the family relationship. We have the obedience of the child, but then we have the careful, respectful lead and discipline of the father. And so Paul says, fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. In other words, he says, don't be harsh in your treatment of the children. Don't be unfair. Uh, treat them with respect and uh, treat them fairly and bring them up, of course, he says elsewhere in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so this wonderful balance, the wife submits, the husband showers love upon her. The child obeys, the father acts towards his child in a way that will not discourage, but will rather encourage the child and will be fair, and will be seen to be fair. And then finally, we come on to the last pair, and he talks about the servants. It's interesting that he spends most time in this passage talking to the servants. I suppose in the churches to which Paul is writing, these servants would make up the highest proportion of the members of the local church. Many who were converted would be slaves. Paul has some lovely things to say about service of the servant. Listen to what he says. He says, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. He, he takes everything about the servant's position and he relates it to God. And he says, now, you should be looking at your master and acting towards your master as you would look towards God and as you would act towards God. So uh, you might be tempted just to be a good servant while the eye of your master is upon you. Paul says, remember, the eye of God's upon you all the time, and you're serving not just before your earthly master, you're serving before God. And then he says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men. And so here is a servant who's not just giving the minimum that is necessary. He's putting his heart into his service. He's, he's a very good servant because the secret behind this, and the other servants would notice it, they would only do the minimum perhaps that would be required of them, but the Christian servant would go be above and beyond. He would do it heartily because the secret is he's doing it for the Lord. And then he says, verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. In other words, he's saying, you may not get much of a reward down here. You may have no inheritance at all. You may not get much pay, if any pay at all. But remember this, that you're going to receive a reward in a coming day. Of course, we take these instructions and apply them to ourselves, not in terms of slavery, but in terms of our careers, our jobs, the positions we occupy, the ways in which we serve our earthly masters, we apply these principles to our daily living. And it's encouraging to think that even in our daily living, in the common things of our lives, we're serving the Lord Christ. Let us do it well. Finally, he turns to the master because there are Christian masters in the local church as well. And he says, now give to your servants what is just and what is fair and what is equal. And it must have been quite a testimony to see how Christian masters treated their slaves, treated their servants, as opposed to uh, unbelieving masters. And Paul says, let it be that you've got this wonderful balance between the servant who's serving as if he's serving God himself, and he will receive a reward for that. And on the other hand, the master who is being fair towards his servants knowing that he has a master in heaven himself. These are wonderful practical truths. And if we put them into practice, it will 
revolutionize our lives. It would improve our testimony and it would bring glory to the Lord because these are the features of the new man, the new position that we have in Christ. We have the clothing of the new man and we have the control of the new man and the conduct of the new man. May the Lord help us in our daily living to work these things out in practice. Thank you for watching.